Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for coming today. Um, I think we're going to have a really good panel. Uh, and the idea is sort of as follows. We've now reached a point in history where most companies have some kind of gender diversity program underway, but this is not a particularly gr glamorous or creative or sexy project. Our idea here is to make it a little bit more sexy. Um, and, uh, and with me today, I have from the right, Luis Silemingas, who is managing director of IDEO in the UK. Um, and to my left is Marie-Aimé de Dampierre, uh, who is managing partner in the Paris office of Hogan, Hogan Lavelles. Um, and to my immediate right, Arunima Kapoor Duque, who is a senior design research lead at IDEO. Um, so my first question goes to Louise, who um, actually trained in electrical engineering and worked in car design um, before switching his focus um, from analytics to more behavioral, behavioral engineering, let's, see, let's say. And, um, and the question I would like to put to you is, so gender diversity is generally falls to HR and it is generally seen in the context of compliance. Compliance is not, um, is not a charismatic endeavor necessarily. Um, why don't you sketch out a different way of seeing it? Yeah, thank you. And uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. Um, um, actually, I am yeah, I'm an engineer. I'm an electric engineer. I started uh, with a with a with a very analytical way of approaching problems, thinking that anything can be solved with an equation. Um, since I joined IDEO, which is a company that uses design in order to approach creatively many other challenges, in general human challenges, I've kind of really that has really challenged my own kind of view of the world. Uh, so. In, uh, is that lens that I would like to bring to the, to the conversation. Um, it was a great debate yesterday uh, on diversity programs, whether they are useful or whether they're not useful. Um, and I found that that debate was in violent agreement at the end. I don't know if, uh, what, what your feeling was. I thought that they were just agreeing, they were just saying the same thing in kind of slightly different ways. Like diversity programs need to be completely redesigned. They need to be think, thought in a very, di very different way. And, 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 and with, in my observation, having worked on a few diversity uh, projects with IDEO, uh, is that um, diversity is a deeply cultural and emotional subject in organizations. And we are approaching it with a very analytical toolkit. The people that work in HR uh, and the groups, uh, and the people that work in HR sometimes is not very diverse. It's not a group that is incredibly representing uh, the diversity that we want to develop in the organization and the tools that they're using are often uh, uh, you know um, uh, process tools to make uh, quality to make to make processes tick but rather but not very um, creative tools in order to come up with new solutions and new ideas so the way we've been approaching it with a creative toolkit which is uh, build out of uh, a deep empathy of understanding people very well that are basically understanding the organization understanding people well and being very experimental about the way in which you will be going to kind of found that solution. So, you know, um, there is a very strong point that, that, that the whole conference has been talking about, about how clear the case for diversity is from a business point of view. So why don't we think about diversity in a much more entrepreneurial way, where we give it a budget, where we think, you know, it's gonna generate so much money, let's give, uh, a f let's set up a few teams, let's get them to collaborate and work together, let's have a representation of men and women, into them and let's get them on with experiments and ways of being pragmatic about how to do and how to come up with solutions. Let's not be dogmatic about how to approach it. Let's be pragmatic and build on the culture of entrepreneurship that very often exists in companies to, to, to make more progress and see how, uh, as Siri was saying yesterday, we see the outcomes rather than basically stick to the principles that we started with. So. With that as our, our kind of thesis statement, I want to ask Marie Aimé, having implemented some new ideas or new initiatives within, um, within companies, what are the obstacles that you have encountered on that? Um, first, I would like to make a remark. I wonder whether diversity or the fact that uh, some people might be reluctant or not so open to diversity 
is not a generation issue. Because I look at the young people uh, in our organization, it's a law firm, uh, I look at my children, it's really not a problem. You know, uh, being gay, being lesbian, handicapped, where you are from Asia, you are from Africa, you are white, where is the problem? That's normal. I would say that it concerns, it's more difficult, you know, uh, to have those kind of discussion and more senior people being involved. And it can be quite easily explained in a way. Today you have internet, the world is global. When we were, I was educated, you know, in a very uh, traditional family, so white, Catholic, and apart from this world, nothing was existing or nothing was as good as, uh, as it was. So um, I think it's a question of education. And in addition, uh, when you look, I think it's very true in France, in some companies and even us, when we recruit people, we have a criteria. You know, it's in a way quite elitist. We want the best people, but we see that we somewhat recruit people from the very same, you know, university, schools with a similar background, meaning that when they are joining the company, well, they are very similar, and you don't find uh, the diverse people you need. I fully am uh, um, convinced that diversity, uh, you are rich, you learn openness, uh, it, it brings a lot of value. Not only does it allow you to attract people and to retain people, but also in terms of business, it's more and more important. And those who are reluctant, at least to understand that for, for us in particular as lawyers, our clients are going in the same direction. They want to work with diverse team. And when they hire a lawyer, they want to be, uh, as they say, hey, what are you doing on this side? So I think um, it's a very uh, interesting time. It's a time of change. Uh, it's obvious we have to change. We have to be diverse. Uh, and there are many reasons for that. There are professional reasons, that's for sure. But there can also be personal reasons because of all the, you know, the environment at work, at home, uh, and if you are parents, because all the children, your, the young generation around you. So it's really something uh, you need uh, to, you know, to go, to enter, and to, to integrate. And I know uh, that they will, we will, um, it will be beneficial to all of us. So, so now we come to what is, I, I would argue, the most exciting part of our discussion, which is, which is looking at the actual tools that can change people's behavior on a mass scale. And I'm an American, and I personally look back on the introduction of standardized testing as something that really broke up our elites and bro broke up our pipelines in America. Um, so Arunima is going to talk a little bit about, um, about some of the some of the tools, quantitative, analytical, that, that can change the way people make decisions in offices. Thank you so much for not raising expectations. This is the interesting part. Great. So I'm going to make three points, because three is always a good number to make points with, and then people remember them. So I'm going to start at the top, which is my world, which comes from research. Um, and the first thing I'm going to tell you about research is that you have to design for bias. So when you look at traditional market research, the first thing that people are trying to do is eliminate bias and spend a lot of time proving that this is not a bias study. Now that is an impossible thing to do because it's designed by humans and with humans. And with humans come bias. So there's no way that you can design in a way that doesn't account for bias. So the first point is make sure that you are designing for bias. And what does that mean? So. Um, we're all biased as human beings. So the first point is to stop the us versus them, which is you guys need the training, I don't. You know, I'm, I'm kind of female and Asian, so I probably don't have biases. That's not true, of course I have biases as well. So the first point is let's all approach it from one point of view, a human point of view. Um, and this conference talks a lot about what that means. So a great example of designing for bias is this um, HP developed this service called Textio in which, uh, which I'll read, spell checks for gender bias. So when you put out a brief into the world that is written by people who just want a younger version of themselves, they're probably gonna get a younger version of themselves. So the point is, how do you put out something into the world, a job application into the world that will attract diversity? So that's one way of designing for bias, acknowledging that we all have it, but what can we do to overcome it? So that's point number one. The second one is how do you use design thinking? So the, the main thing about design thinking is building empathy. 
usually we do that at a one-to-one -one basis. So I'll go cook with people or hang out you know, in their kitchens or walk in their shoes, literally sometimes. Uh, watch them clean toilets, I've done that as well, uh, to find out you know, what's working and not in that area. We can talk about that after. Um, so it's about uh, you know, gaining empathy. However, in this case, we need to create empathy for a group. And the West is not very good at designing for groups. It's very good at designing for individuals. So I might even say, maybe we need to rethink or reframe what we mean by diversity. Is it really, it's kind of like trying to pursue happiness. You know, it's kind of quite a hard thing to do. And to do it, you need time and you need to get multiple stakeholders involved in order to achieve it. It can't be something that you do overnight, you put out there and then you hope for the best. So I read um, a lovely thing which said, uh, actually it's a lady from Howard, she did a study and she uh, kind of works in public policy. She said, the fathers of daughters are much better at promoting gender equality. Surprise, surprise. So, you know, that's a unique way to look at it. Why don't we corral the people that we know can help us and that we actually know will help us get to this point? So, you know, it's, it's thinking about the human which is selfish it's about telling people what's in it for me. Because all of us want to know how this is gonna benefit me. And that means everybody, not excluding a bunch of people, you know, excluding a certain group of white male people is actually as biased as, as not. So making sure we don't do an us versus them and making it inclusive. The last point you'll be happy to know before we move on um, is about what kind of design approach we might look at. So when we're looking at something like this, uh, we were having a chat and I thought about kind of gardening versus architecture. So um, we all know that diversity thrives, right? So hybrid cultures take root better, they survive better. Monocultures are less resilient, are less good at being that. So why don't we look at diversity as something that we need to garden and create an environment around um, in, in our workplaces rather than just structures and strict rules? You might need a bit of that, of course, because you need to introduce some elements and hope they take root and hope that do they do well. You need to disrupt the environment, for sure. But think about it as something that's gardening and nurturing rather than here's a strict structure or we, we, you know, we've reached that, that uh, quota. And that also helps you with retention because maybe you can get a bunch of diverse people in, but if your culture hasn't adapted, uh, they're not gonna stay. They're not gonna feel comfortable. They're not gonna speak up in meetings. They're not gonna contribute. They're probably gonna leave. So it's all about looking at it as a much, much broader approach. And a quick example on that is from IDEO where we had a group of people in the company and they created this little group, group called Prideo. Um, and the company found out about it, it was self-generated, and they gave them a budget. They said, that's wonderful. You're empowered to create this group, and we're gonna support it. So those are kind of three quick little tips, but I'm sure we're gonna talk about more in a second. Before we, before we open this up to discussion, I also, I just wanna press a little farther on this, because the entry point to organizations is hiring. And hiring, as anyone who does it, will realize is sometimes a kind of a black magic. You you have to fall back on intuition, you have feelings about people, there's so much you don't know about everyone you hire. So, I'm, so I'd like to ask all of you, are there kind of syst systematic ways to eliminate bias during that process um, or, or to guarantee that there will be diversity created by it? So I have a, um, a couple of little experiments we, we are starting, we've started to do in the projects we, we've, we, we're going. Um, we're helping with uh, one of them is uh, actually a, f a live feedback uh, uh, live feedback tool that when um, candidates are interviewed they are asked immediately after they're interviewed how was their interview how did they feel uh, you know in order to start kind of short circuiting and start to connecting how custom how how candidates feel because if we want to have a good representation of them uh, you know uh, uh, we need to understand exactly how were their feelings and how well we are interviewing them right so quite a, a, a quick quick little thing to do, but quite interesting in order to start improving. At the end of the day, what we need to do is be very pragmatic at improving our processes very well. Another idea we are, we are testing with is the idea of hiring teams, not hiring individuals. So if you think about, uh, you know, in the world of startups, 
the unit of the unit that you actually invest in is very often the team, right? Because you know that if you have a team that works well, you've eliminated the highest risk of something going wrong. Um, what if we had the same approach to the way in which we bring people from uh, universities or we hire people, where we kind of put together a team that we, want, we know is going to work, we know it's got the diversity included in it, so it has, it's got a great, interesting, different perspectives going into it, and we start kind of building, bringing a little bit more of that creative unit into the organization that is going to start kind of having uh, uh, already a much stronger kind of approach and feeling of belonging from the start. So, just a couple of a couple of ideas, and, and I would love to hear what what you guys think uh, after that. So, um, so now we can just talk about this more generally. Um, we have Siri Otila here in the uh, in the audience, and she's going to start off our discussion. Thank you, Ellen. I'd actually like to pick up on Luis's last point about behavioral-based interventions. Um, I'm a researcher at the Women in Public Policy Program at the Harvard Kennedy School in Boston, Massachusetts, or Cambridge, actually. Um, and Aronima, I think you believe you quoted my colleague, Iris Bennett, um, in that Fathers with Daughters example. She wrote a book called What Works? Gender Equality by Design, which was published last year, which is basically the most comprehensive collection that we have to date about the specific interventions that have been proven to work in organizations. It's a start. We have a long way to go, but it includes some of these specific prescriptions, for example, for how to debias the hiring process. Things like reviewing resumes blindly without names attached, or grading the candidates immediately after the interview instead of waiting a couple of days. Um, so I highly recommend that as a resource. But in your experience, all of you, how do you get companies to move from trying to change hearts and minds to actually understanding that they need to embed changes in their processes and in their structures? Um, so that instead of l trusting individual people, individuals, or even teams to change their practices, we make it easy for them. We make it automatic for them to behave in a better way. can try. Um, I think the very interesting thing about it is to think about where does human help or hinder and where does technology help and hinder. So we're quite lucky um, that we have uh, technology um, in a w and it can be used you know, in an impartial way. I, that, I guess that could be a whole debate, but um, how do we utilize that? So what's very interesting about this is that Airbnb, I know, I'm sure everybody knows of Airbnb, they were receiving complaints that a lot of people were refusing uh, black people when they, when they applied to stay there, or Asian people. And there was a company that created an app, a plug-in app called Debias Yourself. And what it helped people do is put that on their profile, and actually when they got the message, they only saw the message and the ratings for that person. They never actually saw who it was coming from, or what race they were, or what age they were. So that's a wonderful deployment of technology to kind of help us um, in bringing those biases to the forefront. The wonderful thing about it is also is, is testing yourself is a really fun human thing to do. There's that kind of big surprise at the end. Oh my God, I took this test. I'm slightly racist. I didn't know that, you know? <laughs> and like, oh my God, we all did it as a colleague. We all did it as colleagues and we all came out like, you know, less good than we had hoped. And we have this image of ourselves um, and doing these things and surprising ourselves. It's the same as doing one of those leadership tests. What kind of leader am I? You know, there's a lovely human, big reveal surprise element. So again, let's look at the human. Let's look at technology and see how we can utilize those um, in this sphere and what one does well and what the other does well. I think that uh, you are well uh, ahead in the thinking of where we are as a law firm. First of all, I think I believe we have to create an environment where diversity is there and in your unconscious, you know you will be influenced. Also, you have to have, as you say, and it goes uh, to your point, to have people having empathy or sympathy for that, meaning that uh, we launched a pride initiative uh, last year, um, again, to develop awareness um, um, f um, on the uh, LGBT community. It's not so much about women, because uh, we are a place where we have a lot of women. Uh, a third of the partners are women, which is excellent. But it's about, you know, uh, making through a, a theater, uh, you know, um, spe how do you spill on? Yes, uh, uh, theater, you know, um, 
play, uh, make people understand, well, uh, how is it and how you feel when you, 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 when you feel that you cannot express yourself, you cannot be yourself, you cannot say that I'm a gay, and even the fact that not only you cannot uh, um, develop or feel that you can develop or people are not open to that, but you create bears, bars, you know, for yourself, which prevent you to really have the conversation you want or to say, hey, I'm a gay, but I, it's not uh, something uh, wrong. Uh, I can be as successful as anyone, and here is the way I want to develop. But as you don't feel safe, you will you know, hide and maybe at one point leave. And I think that just having people understanding this, it's a start and can be a very good start. And then we will think of all the clever uh, you know, tools uh, we can use. So one kind of thought experiment that we discussed earlier is this question of when you're hiring people, let's say the name of the university of the applicant was blacked out. Um, would that help or hurt your ability to hire? I mean, I wonder how important is that information? In, at least in the United States, it tells you a lot about someone's socioeconomic background. It can tell you a lot about their race. Would, would you be able to hire just as well if you didn't have that information? Well, yeah, I don't know. I, so hard, right? Um, we have, there are five or six design universities in London which are the golden design universities. And, um, and in a funny way, like I, I'm thinking about me because we, we hire like, I mean, I hire lots of designers and, uh, and, um, and understanding where they're coming from is telling me the way they think about design, right? Uh, is telling me a little bit the approach that they're gonna have because they are different, obviously, ways of approaching it. And I'm sure that you guys have the same sort of sensibility when you're thinking about the universities that, are, uh, that you are hiring from. Um, the way we have approached this, though, is that we have uh, tried to kind of move away exclusively from hiring designers and bringing lots of different disciplines. So bringing uh, people that had the background in anthropology, people that had background in, 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 in so many different other, other places. Um, and uh, and then trying to kind of instead of looking at the at the at, at the school being number one uh, uh, um, kind of thing, which is like uh, designers and creative people have portfolios, right? They share their portfolios. They are very able to kind of storytell the work that they've done. And I think that that's something that uh, people that are coming from business school or law or something are not are not don't have exactly the same way they, they don't have like a body of work that they can show and they can speak about rather than kind of so they we have to kind of rely on which universities they've kind of gone on i think we might need to evolve the tools that we use in order to hire uh, in order to be able to get away without having that name so um Again, when we, uh, you know, uh, we select CV uh, among very specific criteria because we know the people we want to hire, and that's normal. Uh, I don't know if you have, a, if you are a baker, you are not going to hire someone who has studied law to start. It's excessive, I know, as example. But why not having, you know, uh, some kind of a, a first interview without uh, having all the details about the person, and then. Uh, taking after uh, this first interview and having a, a first impression, looking at the CV, because I really believe at the same time when you recruit, it's important. Uh, you, uh, the CV gives you a lot of information or from experience, you have some sense of how the people will be, you have already recruited from this place or from another place. I think it, it is important. And of course, diversity is very important, but you have to do it quite smoothly. It's also about, you know, integration, uh, making sure that this person will integrate uh, in the right way. It's also about keeping the cohesion of your teams. So I think uh, we have to be careful. I would really love to hear from people in the audience because I'm, I'm sure you've all hired people, you've all been hired. Have you seen anything that works that, um, that helps to eliminate some of these biases? Hi, uh, it's a bit cheeky because we actually run a tool that does all of the things that you're talking about. Um, Applied is a tool that uses Iris's research, she's on our board, to try and remove bias from the hiring process. So we actually jettison the CV and instead test people on what their skills are. 
Uh, and when we ran a huge experiment at the beginning of last year, uh, kind of like a randomised control trial, which for anyone who knows their evaluation is kind of the gold standard for evaluation, we found that over half of the people that were hired wouldn't have been hired using CVs. So we do everything from blinding uh, names and universities from, uh, from the hiring process, but we also use behavioural techniques and data science techniques to help people to concentrate on scoring candidates fairly. So we randomise the order in which candidates are read so that, you know, if you were read before lunch or after lunch doesn't make a difference to whether or not you're getting a high score. So um, if anyone's interested, I'll be around. Um, but I think this is a fascinating um, topic and I'm really excited that there are so many organisations willing to experiment because that's really where the key is. I just want to share a fun fact about uh, recruiting in the music uh, world. Uh, there was recruitment that was done, uh, you know, where they would realize that mostly it's the men uh, musicians who were recruited, and they thought that maybe if they would put a curtain, then that would help not have that bias in choosing your musicians. So they did that, but unfortunately they realized it didn't change anything and they still had very low scores for women. And then they realized that actually they heard the heels of the women clicking <laughs> to the piano. So they put a carpet and then the scores changed drastically and they, they reached parity that way. So I thought that was a, an interesting thing to share. Uh, now I have a question. I'm from Lafarge Holcim. Um, we're, we're trying to, we're just starting on this journey actually. So I just want to understand, so after you get people in, have what's the experience after that? Um, the concern is will there be a pushback, not necessarily from management, but people down the line? The experience of uh, having to integrate this, I, I think that's the, the second part of it, the, uh, which was addressed earlier, that uh, you may have to be a bit careful about um, moving rapidly into this. Um, I just want to hear your thoughts on that, on how to make sure that as you put more people in, there won't be that um, pushback from th th those who will be welcoming them, the, the existing teams. Yeah, I think that's where we should be much more, uh, we should move a little bit the debate around, some, around diversity being a social issue towards being a business issue. And when you see that actually uh, diversity is a business issue, and if you have a more diverse organization, you're gonna grow faster. You're gonna be more resilient for the future. You're not gonna see diversity or, 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 or like a different people around you as a threat to you, but as a chance to kind of grow and, and make a better organization. I think that is the optimism uh, and, and the kind of the, 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 the way in which we think about those programs and that the way that we think that they should be going on. We should think about this as as the creation of movements of growth rather than kind of mandates that are kind of imposed in the, in the company. And, and, that the, um, and, and our hypothesis is that the teams that today are working on many of these programs don't have those tools and perhaps don't even have enough diversity in their organizations to be able to tackle that in a different way. I've never, for example, in all my years of, as a consultant and in big companies, I've never seen uh, a hiring plan made at the moment where the, the where the CEO or the the, the 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 strategy team is thinking about their business strategy, right? If you're thinking about going into a new a, a new a new market or you're developing a new market, the first thing you need to think about is how you're going to diversify your working your 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 employee base in order to be able to be effective there, right? You should. This is this is the way we should be thinking. We should be thinking about. Being diverse first, and then being diverse with our customers. And what happens is that our customers are much more diverse than us, right? So there is kind of this crazy dissonance between, between these two that allows us, that doesn't really allow us to be as flexible and as resilient as, as we could be if, 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 that would be if that would be the case. When, when we are preparing, and uh, maybe you could, uh, it's exactly what you were saying. You are mentioning something which um, I found very um, interesting and powerful. You were saying that you have to bring the customers in your organization so that there is no gap between the, you know, the understanding consumers and the business can have of the service or the products they are offering. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, 
if you think about um, the organizations that are going to be thriving in this digital era, are organizations that have a very quick feedback loop between what the users want and what they are able to do, right? They kind of work very iteratively. If you don't have a workforce that is able to understand what people want and be able to kind of develop products and services that are able to address that, you know, that feedback loop is going to take much longer to develop. And with a lot, with a bunch of we, you know, we have this kind of idea of the, of the uh, middle-aged white uh, man, which is like, like me. <laughs> With all these people, you're never going to do it. Yeah. Uh, well, it's gonna, you're going to struggle. You know, like uh, you, if you think about how diverse our societies are today, and uh, you know, uh, whenever you are, whenever you see that that th there is a, a a big gap between the diversity of your customers and the diversity of your organization, you should think that there is margin of improvement. Starting to bring those insight and those ideas into the organization, present them, is going to make people, uh, make, feel peop make feel people uh, comfortable about what they know about them. And they're going to start thinking about, okay, how can we start hiring people that are going to be able, how can we have a team that's going to be able to address their needs much better? I, I want to give an example from my own industry. I, wor I work for the New York Times. I'm a journalist. And uh, when I started in this profession, we really had no idea who read our stories. It, and it really didn't matter. It wasn't part of our performance review. It wasn't, it just, it wasn't how we chose what to write about or how we chose what to put on the front page. So that has all changed incredibly quickly. You can tell during the first 48 hours after a story is published who reads it, on what continent, what their gender is how much money they make, um, and this is really transforming the industry in some ways that are um, atrocious and in some ways that are really very valuable. So for example, one of the things that um, analytics has told us is that different parts of the newspaper are read um, by different genders differently. Um, so the business section, as you would sort of expect, is read by a much larger proportion of men than women. But one of the things that we found out by doing these analytics is that um, compared to domestic news about the United States, international news is also read vastly disproportionately by men and not women. And then you have to ask sort of why, why is our reporting connecting more with male readers than, than women? And this sort of changes the way we choose what to write about. I mean, if you have a staff of 50-year-old white men writing about what men in power said the day before, you are most likely going to get readers who are also sort of from that same uh, demographic group. So, I mean, I see this as actually quite positive, but it's very challenging to what we've been doing for all these years. So, um, sorry, there's just a... Um uh, a very quick point. It was um, when I finished um, university, one of my friends, she got a job as a, in a recruitment company. And what she told me was totally, this is thankfully 12 years ago and I hope it's changed. But what she told me was they're, they're instructed to look at all the CVs from Oxford, Cambridge and LSE, which are put in a pile. And then people go through that. If they don't find the right candidate there, then they look at the other universities, which is quite terrifying. So when we think about, this is stating the obvious, when we think about diversity, we need to think beyond men and women as well. I mean, the, it's kind of looking at diversity as quite an inclusive thing. Where it is, you know, why did I go to that university? Maybe because I could afford it. Maybe because I had parents who could afford it. You know, and what does that mean about my being able to get the next job, um, you know, and if, if everything's been in your favor, um, you don't even begin to question it. What about race? It's not just enough to have women and men, you know. What about um, representations of different sexualities? So looking, stating the obvious, diversity isn't, as we all know, just about getting more women in there. It's about getting more of everyone in there. That makes sense. I got it, yeah. So a couple things I just wanted to see if we can talk about it a little bit. So I hear everybody really excited about the Airbnb solution, and I'm not happy with that solution, because to me, what they have done is almost as pushing for color blindness. As a black person, color blindness is what, not what I want to hear you tell me. You telling me you're colorblind is, an ins is the mo biggest insult you actually can give me. Because if you have to look, if you have to erase my skin color in order to see me, you haven't seen me. This is part of me, right? And so, um, of course, what's beyond is even is way more important. But this is part of a story, too. So I'm not sure I really like these ideas of we're going to blindside people and choose from there. I want to know what I'm dealing with and who I'm dealing with. The last thing I want to do is give my money 
or be in the home in vibes of someone who doesn't appreciate me for who I am. So I'm not sure if that's a really good solution. Is it better than what we had? Maybe, but I would not call myself like we're happy with that. So that's number one. Then, and I'm not sure what the answers are. Number two um, <coughs> has to do with, um, when we talk about diversity <laughs> and where we are today with implicit biases, media. Media is a huge problem. The way you guys depict even us when we do something versus don't do something, the way you depict women, the way, it's, it's unbelievable. So you have a huge leadership role to play at this point. Um, so maybe, I don't know what's happening on your uh, recruiting side, <laughs> but I do think that there is no waiting time for you. you. There's a lot that can be done right now by media. So I'm looking for that leadership role to happen with the media, doctors, lawyers, because those are in a way key places of our society. Uh, given that the Airbnb example is mine, I'll just attempt to talk about it. So what is interesting about that solution, it didn't come directly from Airbnb actually, and it's not a solution. It's a stopgap. So it was another company that created it that people can add as a plugin onto their profile. So it's optional and it helps me identify as a host that is tolerant or doesn't care about this. And I could not agree more with you on the point that you made. I don't think it's a solution either. I think it's kind of a stopgap, quick fix. It's like a band-aid for now. Uh, because changing hearts and minds and beliefs that we, you know, all of us believe that our beliefs are true. None of us are sitting around questioning all our beliefs. We think all our prejudice biases are totally justified. So I completely agree with you, but I think to get to the point of looking at color and not seeing this, I think we're far away from it. I'm not saying we shouldn't try and achieve it. Of course we should. But uh, you know, I'm Indian as well. I face uh, similar stuff as you do. And it's one of those things where I'm trying to be more pragmatic. What can we do now? How do we move the dial just a little bit, just a little bit, until we get to where we have to? Oh, I totally agree. I 100% agree with you. I'm, I won't try and tackle the media question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hi, Mary Krauss from <coughs> the ITF at OECD. I'm very sympathetic to what you're saying. And I mean, I understand, I think, what you're saying, that this idea that you can wash away uh, distinction, such as the color of one's skin, is not helpful in the absolute. And I, and I totally get that. I'm wondering if we might nuance, I mean, if you would accept to nuance your message just a little bit, when you're dealing with large corporations or large organizations that have been unsuccessful to date in actually implementing any notion of diversity, and that this is one mechanism, perhaps imperfect, and I totally get that, in an early time frame to get the ball rolling, to get the ball rolling. Just as, for example, not including age, just for example as not including gender, washing those out from the recruitment process. That's also a part of the story. So I'm just trying to see in a time frame, how do you roll this out in big monolith organizations that are grappling with the real problem of diversity? <clears throat> Seems like there might be a time frame issue here. <clears throat> Uh, going to what you were just saying, actually, uh, I tend to agree as well because we know that in recruitment, um, a lot of uh, diversity programs do support men and women and, and the quotas and all of that stuff. We've all heard about it. Um, though we know that men recruit people more like them, and that's a temperament, that's a character, and women tend to recruit different than them. That's kind of how we think. Now, in a lot of big corporations, um, a lot of people are willing to include diversity, <laughs> but it's more entrenched in them, especially for men who would like to recruit women, but just feel more comfortable recruiting men. So it's not about them not being diverse, it's about them having to be more self-conscious of who they truly are and what our values are. Do you have any tips or did you find any diversity tools to help men and coach them in not just wanting the diversity but also becoming uh, diverse here which is not the way their brain works most of the time and sorry i'm kind of stereotyping on on <laughs> purpose <laughs> okay can you pass up the mic yes i know i would like to react on this uh 
Yes, uh, being conscious of, be of having a bias is, is not the solution, it's the beginning of the problem. Uh, however, uh, what I found is that there are some tools. The first one is to be, to, to have quantitative objectives. Uh, quantitative objectives on uh, what to recruit because it helps to put pressure on ourselves on what uh, um, diversity means. And uh, then to, to put pressure on the, head on the headhunters to, uh, to give us, uh, um, to give us uh, um, uh, CVs like this. For example, last time I was recruited for, for an executive pro profile and I had back 100% male. So, so, then, uh, uh, so then I had really to make a lot of pressure and go on LinkedIn myself to be sure to, 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 to have uh, alternative uh, uh, CVs. So having a, a quantitative job is, is, not, is, the, uh, is hard because it, the, 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 the easiest one is to pick up uh, um, uh, people like us. Second thing is in the recruiting process, once you have the CVs, is um, what I saw, but this is uh, coming back from my uh, um, consulting experience, is to do case studies. Because what I found out is that uh, we want the, the best talents. But uh, males tend to uh, market their achievements better than, than females. And so uh, there is a second bias that uh, you feel that the guy is better than the woman, but it is just the way they market themselves. So uh, making people work on case studies, uh, make uh, so it's how you solve the problem, how you should react, and then you say, oh, yes, great. This is a good answer. It is, how, uh, it is the, the kind of the people I want to work with and not especially just uh, what they said that they have achieved in their previous um, uh, in their previous uh, in their previous um, uh, jobs. So really, there are lots of bias, and the, uh, the second one really is tough, which is how people market their achievements. And this one is really difficult because you just want to have to to have a winning team, to have good people. So if you don't have the, the uh, I felt that with these two tools, it it helps a little bit, but it's not enough. Is there anyone else who'd like to make a comment? Can you pass the mic down? Hi, I'm Ashton Applewhite, speaking later this afternoon about um, population aging. I'm curious about whether age is a criterion for diversity for anyone. Younger women, of course, face difficulty getting a foothold. Older women are doubly discriminated against in the workplace, and I'm wondering if anyone has any programs to counteract that. Um, I don't know about having programs to counteract. Uh, did you have? Siri, no, okay. Um, about programs to counteract it, but definitely age is um, is is it is about diversity. And actually, I was talking to our HR person, and he was trying to say how diversity is across. What about life stage? Is that about diversity? Because um, how do we help retain uh, women or parents who have kids and then they drop out because there's not structures around it? So he said, what they've what what we try and do is get people to work four days a week, or get them to work on a project-to-project -project basis, or kind of create structures and say, as a team, let's agree our working times are 10 to 4. Around that, everybody can do their individual flexible work whenever they like. So how do we create conditions? And um, I think from a design thinking perspective, let's design from the extremes. So that is what we believe. Let's design for, for the youngest, let's design for people with babies, and let's design for 80-year-olds. And what would work look like then? And maybe we could come up with something that is actually flexible and inclusive enough for everybody else. Uh, yeah, very quickly. We, we have this beautiful story at IDEO um, uh, because um, this 93-year-old uh, uh, lady wrote us a letter uh, speaking about uh, that she had, she had had three jobs before, like as a nurse, many other things. She had jobs, but she had always been a designer. Um, uh, and she wrote such a beautiful letter. We, kind of, uh, we were working on, uh, on aging uh, pr projects as well. So we've, we invited her, and she's been working two or three days a week for a year and a half with us. And she's given so much wisdom and inspired the community so much. It's really changed. Uh, design, which is a, a young uh, kind of uh, uh, industry, uh, uh, up to set, uh, is just given us a, a, a such a different new dimension. Um, so, you know, being open or, or being kind of looking for some of these opportunities uh, is, a, is a great way to start. Can I just add one more, because someone you need to look at the law and have the law change. I was very surprised when I was discover, discovering that when you are age 45, you are among the monk the uh, old people, and then you have to take a special care or attention to them. That's <laughs> <laughs> so, w oh, one more comment. Um, 
This is, this is our last comment, and then we're going to wrap up. Um, I'm sorry for making you get delayed, but there are two comments I wanted to make. A lot of people are talking about here about from a perspective of someone who is interviewing or is the employer, not the employee. I've been working for five years, because five years ago I graduated from university. I'm technically a millennial. But um, my dream job that I wanted, I had, it was a, in an investment bank. I'm from an engineering background, so I'm not scared of working in a male-dominated industry. Um, I had an American investment bank. I had 10 rounds of interviews to get to the final round. And out of the t 10 rounds of interviews, I met 24 people. Out of the 24 people, two were women. So, and at the end, um, one or two of them became my friends uh, from the boys. And they said that I got to the final round, I got rejected because most of them couldn't see going to the pub with me. Now, <laughs> they said that? Yeah. So, they said that after the interview? No, no, no. As in, in, a, in a conversation over drinks as a friend a year later. Right? So right. you kind of think, okay, it's all great talking about this, but actually, if out of 24 people who are judging you, two are women, the boys want to hire another boy to go to the pub with. Right. Right? So, um, and it's always the HR, and I don't want to stereotype, but there are women in the HR that want to do work on diversity, but they're not doing the interviews. Right. So that's what you need to change if you really want to change anything. Because they probably don't think they're being sexist. They probably don't realize that. But that basically has to be flushed out of the system because right. that's, um, that's absolutely and, bias in hiring. And the other comment I had is to agree about the media point. We are in a time that everyone talks about millennials. We like social media, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But at the end of the day, we are getting force-feeded information um, on Instagram, Facebook, whatever, about ch like changing perspective of success. Success is now defined as um, number of followers you have, how pretty you are as a blogger on Instagram or whatever. And then what is happening is women in media who should be helping other women are mm. actually creating this. All these magazines who are putting supermodels on their covers are run by women, why are they not putting, I don't know, a, a successful woman who is maybe a bit chubbier, older, whatever, on their covers? Why are we begin being forced with women? Women are force feeding each other about the idea of success and looks. Thank you very much for that. And thanks, everyone, especially, especially the panelists, who are very brilliant and good humored.